Okay, good afternoon. I must admit that when Andy invited me to speak at this event, I was somewhat discomforted because big data is just not a phrase, a term that we use very frequently within the Digital Curation Center. So, of course, I looked it up to find a definition. There it was, big data, data that is too large, that has too great a velocity for the conventional platforms to, to handle, to process them. So, it did sound very much to me that this was an IT issue. It's technology, it's not to do with the data that we get our hands on in our business. Um, and I thought, this is hype, it's, it's much ado about nothing. So I consulted the Bard in much ado about nothing, and he said, well, he had great foresight looking ahead at the flood or the data deluge. He said, what need the bridge much broader than the flood? We need something that is fit for purpose. It's not a big deal, uh, move on. But I wanted to be sure so I looked up the research interests of uh, some of today's speakers, and there it is. Network security, mobile computing, cloud and grid technologies. It's, it's a technology issue. It's not something that we normally deal with uh, within the Digital Curation Center. Who are we? Well, we've been going now since 2004, and principally our aim is to invest in universities in UK the ability to manage data, to, to gain capability in handling data, to understand the tools, to be able to apply the tools. And we've increased our focus there on institutions since about this time last year. We had additional funding to actually get out amongst a minimum of 18 institutions and work with them uh, to provide them with the skills to curate their data. And by curation of data, I'm talking about managing data from the point of creation uh, through to disposal so that data is uh, available, it's, it's findable, it's usable, and it can be used in the future right up to that point of disposal. So it's, it's the whole manipulation of data, not the technology that carries it, not the plumbing. However, it did seem sensible to think of this in terms of what we do. We, we currently have three perspectives on the research data environment. Uh, scale and complexity, and of course that's going to include big data, but not all of it. It's the complexity that really is of interest to us. Uh, volume and pace, yes, infrastructure, okay, but also things like open science and open data. A controversial area we find uh, where researchers will accept the need to be open, uh, but not necessarily with their data. Um, Open science, open data is, is one where a lot of persuasion is needed and there, that is the complexity behind it, not just the complexity of the data itself. Policy, uh, we have legislation, we have the funders uh, coming out with increasingly prescriptive demands for how research communities will manage their data. Uh, and in response to this, of course, institutions are now beginning to produce their own data policies uh, and they have to cover such specifics as ethics. Uh, we had some references earlier to the ethical handling of data. Uh, there are ethical issues which will complicate matters. And finally, management. The third perspective, uh, obviously storage. Uh, what's the best, most cost-effective way of storing your data? What data should you store? What data can you get rid of to reduce your costs? Uh, and particularly incentives, incentivizing researchers to actually take it seriously. I mean, they're busy people, they're undertaking research, their focus is the research, the data, that's just something It's like shavings from a, from a big workbench in a, in a woodcutter's yard. It's, it's the stuff that you produce, you provide your paper from it, but the, it's then discarded. And we have to change that, that mindset. And of course, cost and sustainability. So that's, they're the three perspectives that we normally put on uh, research data management. But I do think I ought to look at big data again. One project that we became involved with, I, I did a study of them over a year a couple of years back, uh, was Carmen. Carmen was a, a, a neuroscience project funded between 2006 and 10, uh, and their issue was that there were more than 100,000 researchers uh, working on the central nervous system, the CNS, uh, generating what they described as massive and intricate data sets, uh, and they wanted to be able to share this raw data in many cases, this experimental data, so that they could each work on it from, from a a very distributed location. They seem to have cracked it. Um, this was their plan. Um, they produced a virtual laboratory, uh, which was a federation of server nodes, uh, and data would be, dis would be stored locally to where it was generated. 
uh, analysis codes will be uploaded and executed on those nodes so that you needn't transport them over low, low bandwidths. Uh, the data and analysis codes were, were based on a, a very robust uh, set of structured metadata and users could access the distributed resources through a web portal and it was just very familiar stuff. So it seemed to be, well, here's scale, uh, but I would emphasize its complexity as well. That, that was what they were struggling with, but they seemed to have a clear view of where to go. But this is only talking terabytes and you may not think that's really big data. So let's look at really big data, the LHC, which everybody's heard about. Now I don't know whether they've actually found the Higgs boson yet, but they do seem to have sorted their data. They, they're producing, or predicted to produce, around 15 petabytes annually. Um, they are getting on with the job. One of the contributing groups is Group PP in the UK. And here we have, they are, they are contributing uh, more than the equivalent of 20,000 PC power to the effort. There's a, a charming video on the Grid PP site uh, where they say with Grid PP you need never have those data processing blues again. So obviously there's a certain confidence there. And how about innovation? The crowdsourcing is being used as a means of actually distributing the power. We have through the LHC at Home project uh, 40,000 users involved in contributing a resource to this effort. So again, have they got it sorted? Well, not exactly. They, they do admit that whilst they're actually managing to generate, store, transmit, uh, even analyze the data, they are falling short when it comes to preservation. And that brings it back into our field where, of course, data preservation is, is part of digital curation. We've got to preserve the data in a manner in which it's retrievable and reusable. What's concerning, of course, is the actual investment in high energy physics data, which is huge. Uh, and maybe that is what really defines big data in that it's the capital investment, the investment of people's time, which is perhaps larger than in other disciplines. So thinking of other disciplines, I thought, well, I have to look at genomics. Um, this is really a good example. We, we've heard in, by the, with the previous speaker how raw image files are, are large, 28.8 terabytes. They're not only large, but because the cost of sequencing DNA is reducing so much and so rapidly, it's likely that the, the increase in, in data will re reflect that reduction as well. We hear that the Thousand Genomes Project generated more sequence data in its first six months in 21 years at the GenBank. So massive and we find that a single sequencer can generate in a day what it took 10 years to collect. So it is big, it's volatile, it has a velocity, and one can probably say that here is really the example of the data deluge. So I had a look at um, our previous speaker's site at the University of Leicester and found where the studies they're undertaking are generating data sets which because of their size and again the keyword complexity uh, need to be skillfully managed and if I can read the rest of it uh, not just managed but quality controlled integrated and safely archived and to me that does bring it all back into the arena of digital curation so is it because of the size of it is it because of the, the velocity of it or is it simply that it's conspicuous Thinking back to our three perspectives, what we're doing now with institutions is, is helping them design and implement research data management services. And we have those three perspectives translated uh, somewhat in, into more detail. We're looking at socio-technical management perspectives. For example, uh, how do you actually encourage people to apply time and effort to simply, for example, giving metadata to their, their data so that other people can actually understand it. If it's shared, what's the point of sharing it unless it's comprehensible? Information systems perspectives, the platforms, research practice, actually getting researchers to embed planning of, re of the, the data output and the data management uh, within their research lifecycle. And once we look at those, we then attempt to initiate change 
And the keynote speaker this morning is saying that is the big thing, it's change management. Uh, identify who are those who are going to go along with this enthusiastically, uh, identify what capabilities they have, increase their capabilities, uh, diagnose the practices, where are those practices not fit, where do they need development, and then redesign the research data services. Uh, well, that is what we are totally engaged with, uh, to produce change that is desirable, not, a, not this imposed, that never works in the university environment. Uh, change that is services that are feasible, services that are fit for purpose and they need be no more. Uh, this is what we're currently doing. We're working, as I said, 18 institutions. We also have 14 roadshows on the go. Uh, we provide advice and assistance in strategy, in the development of research data policy, uh, in the use of tools for audit and planning, and particularly in training and skills transfer. And in terms of training, uh, we are very much committed to getting the early researcher, the early career researcher, so that what we would recommend they do in terms of research data management becomes the norm, that it's, it's taken on as the way they work that is normal and natural for them. Why do we do it? Quickly. Reports that researchers are unaware of threats and opportunities. This is from a project that we were involved with. Researchers said they kept their data on data sticks. They didn't know that there were central servers. Lack of clarity in skills acquisition. Researchers were reluctant to adopt tools that uh, they didn't know someone who could recommend it. So there are, there are service failures here. Uh, unprepared to meet uh, the demands of the funders. We've all been in universities, at least, been through the EPSRC roadmap design. Uh, we found the Friday before the deadline that some universities we were talking to hadn't started on this. Uh, and legislation, apart from the, the research councils, there's also uh, the Freedom of Information Act, the Data Protection Act. We've seen Climate Go to East Anglia. Uh, the, the tree rings problems in, in Northern Ireland, etc., etc. I'm moving on quickly. Um, and finally, the advantages from planning. And part of this planning for sharing data is the real hot potato because where is the incentive? That's what they always cry. Where is the incentive? What's in it for me? And we've got to build up a good argument for that to be achieved. As someone said, it's like giving away your baby if you're giving away your data. So this is what we're engaged with using our tools uh, and I have some supplementary slides here which will be uh, available which explains each of the tools uh, but we are simply evaluating the processes in place looking to improve the tool sets and enabling people to manage their data. Uh, these are the issues that they are most concerned with, complying with legislation, uh, identifying their assets, uh, looking for cost benefits Big data, nobody's mentioned it. And yet institutions are actually supporting work on big data. But really what I would say is that the issues are not because of big data. The issues are there in big data, uh, but they are the same issues that we have to deal with, uh, with small or medium data, whatever that is, irrespective of size. Uh, some engagements that we're engaged in, uh, we are assessing needs, policy development, the gamut is there. And just to end very quickly, those are the things that we have on offer. Do visit our site, uh, you'll find out more. And as I said, there, there are a greater explanation of the tools on offer.